Hello. <laughs> Hello. My name is Julie. I'm a volunteer with Sea Shepherd Montreal. We're a brand new chapter, almost a year in now. And uh, we're a, and for people who don't know us, we're a conservation protection organization for the oceans. And uh, we are a direct action organization, meaning we stand between the victims and their poachers. Um, we specialize in oceans protection. Um, and right now our biggest campaign is plastics in the ocean because that's a big, big, big problem. And I'm here today to introduce Professor Marino, uh, who's a neuroscientist and an expert in dolphins and primates. I'm messing up. <laughs> um, behavioral animal expert. And uh, she will be talking about the dolphins and who they are and how to better understand them and protect them, hopefully. Thank you. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Thank you all for being here. Um, you might have noticed that on the, uh, on the writing, I'd said uh, a question mark, who are dolphins? And then I uh, called Steve and said, you know, yeah, let's make it that. And, but Steve said, oh, but you know, who dolphins are? That's, that's really good too. So I have that as the title here. So don't be confused, it's the same talk. <laughs> so today uh, we're gonna be talking about a number of different topics, but all related to the question of who dolphins are and of course, in order to understand dolphins, it's really important to know something about their evolution and their phylogeny. It is such an interesting story, and I'll tell you about some of the things we know about these animals from that point of view. Then we'll talk about brain size and complexity. Again, that's another important issue because dolphins and whales have very large, complex brains. Uh, and they're sort of known for that. And I've been studying uh, brain size and complexity in dolphins and whales for uh, at least 25 or 30 years. And uh, it's a very, very interesting story there as well. Uh, then we'll get into dolphin psychology, what they're doing with their big brains. And some discussion of who dolphins are we're never gonna define who dolphins are. We can talk about the things we know about them, right? And uh, some of the things that might be the case about them. So we'll, we'll end with maybe more questions and one big question in particular than answers. So let's talk about dolphin phylogeny and evolution. And maybe I will take this. Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> so dolphins are part of the cetacean order and they are part of the suborder Odontocetes. And there's another modern suborder, Mysticetes. And there was an initial suborder, which is now extinct, called Archaeocetes. And on the right you see the closest living relative to dolphins and whales, the hippopotamus. And that sort of gives you some idea of, quote, where these animals are coming from, because they are very similar to ungulates, okay? Uh, they're not at all similar to primates and, and other animals. It, it gives you an idea of what they're like, and the hippopotamus is their closest modern relative. A little bit about cetacean evolution in one slide, which is absolutely ridiculous, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So we know that about 50 to 55 million years ago, uh, there was an animal that lived near the Tethys, what's now the Tethys Sea, called Pachycetus. And that animal 
as you see on top there, uh, was about the size of a medium-sized dog, had fur, and at the ends of its feet, there were hooves, not claws, hooves. And that animal, for some reason, adopted a semi-aquatic lifestyle, and by around 47 million years ago or so, um, we see a number of incredible transitional forms of cetaceans. The cetacean evolution story is probably the best story, uh, empirical evidence for evolution, if ever there was one. I mean, because we have a beautiful collection of transitional forms. You see this, uh, this guy here, that's Rhodocetus. And you can see he's already starting the, 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 the feet and hands are elongating into flippers. You already see the blowhole is actually moving up the cranium. Uh, the tail is a little bit different. This is a real intermediate form. Um, by about 40 million years ago, as you see there, they were all fully aquatic. And we're talking about archaeocetes here, right? Um, all fully aquatic, all very large. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about body size in a moment. But by 40 million years, they were fully aquatic. And they stayed that way for about 10 million years. And then as they say, something happened. Around 30 or 35 million years ago, something big happened because the archaeocetes went extinct. Obviously not all of them because we have the emergence of the early modern forms. The early modern uh, odonocetes, as you see on the left, and the early modern mysticetes on the right. So it's that period around 30 to 35 million years that was the difference that made the difference for dolphins and whales. And I'll give you the evidence for that uh, shortly. Today, there's a lot of diversity in cetaceans. There are actually 76 species of odontocetes, toothed whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and 42 different species of dolphins. They all belong to the family Delphinidae, and um, they're only one of six families of odontocetes. And then we have uh, 14 species across three families in the suborder Mysticeti. Now, depending upon who you talk to, those numbers shift around a little bit, but generally they're the same. It depends upon whether you're a lumper or a splitter. Um, but there, there are a lot of species of dolphins that uh, go beyond the handful of dolphins that we think of when we think of dolphins. And important to note that all delphinids are dolphins. So again, there's, there's a tremendous diversity uh, in just that particular family, but they all share characteristics that make them dolphins. And that includes the killer whale, orca who is the largest dolphin. So here's the story. Here's the big thing. This is the thing that um, I was very happy to contribute, the story that I was very happy to contribute to with my research. Um, it's a fascinating story. This is what we know. Around 30, 35 million years ago, there was a critical shift in the evolution of cetaceans, placing them on the path to becoming among the world's most highly encephalized and socially complex beings on the planet. Now, if you look at the archaeocete on the left, the characteristics of archaeocetes were this. They had big bodies. They had small brains big teeth. We don't know that much about their social life. We know they did not echolocate. But they were quite formidable predators. I mean, if you see the guy on the left in the ocean, you are going to head the other way, right? Um, and so they were like that for, for a very long time, about 
10 million years, um, completely fully aquatic, but uh, being very successful with small brains and big teeth. And around 30 or 35 million years ago, there was a shift in oceanic temperatures and a turnover of prey availability. So we know. And the guys on the left went out and the guys on the right came in. Now, they weren't like that when they came in. They were the mod early modern forms, but um, the formidable large predator with big teeth was replaced with a smaller bodied predator with small homodontous teeth and importantly, a big brain. So whatever it was that required an adaptation, um, the big adaptation that occurred was big brain. We believe that it's possible that social life started to get more complex at that point. And we also know they started to echolocate around that time. So lots of stuff happened. Now, we know this about the brain from work we've done, uh, looking at the fossil record of cranial capacity in dolphins and whales uh, back to about 47 million years ago. And what you see is a graph here with uh, millions of years up to the present in, on the left and on the right. Um, you have EQ, which is simply a measure of how big the brain is compared with the body. And for instance, our EQ is seven, so we have really large brains for a body size. And one, an EQ of one would mean that you're pretty average mammal, you have a brain about as big as you'd expect for your body. So what the take home message for this is the following, if you look at the area in blue or purple, um, where it says Archaeocede, those are data points for EQ for Archaeocedes. Um, and you can see that they're all shifted to the left, meaning that they all had quite small brains for their body size. Their EQs were very low. And then again, when you look at some of the modern forms that came in, which are the parts in orange um, that are between 35 and say uh, 5 million years, you could see this shift. And this was a significant increase in encephalization. And that increase just continued and uh, sort of went into stasis, we think about 15 million years ago. And on top, there are all the modern forms. So something happened that required them to really shift their behavioral ecology in a way that really set them on a path to becoming uh, extraordinarily intelligent and socially complex animals. This is a graph showing how large their brains are compared with ours in terms of encephalization. Modern humans with an encephalization quotient of close to seven. We've got some of our closest relatives, gorillas, orangutans, chimpanzees, with uh, encephalization quotients in the 2.5 to 2.7 range, still highly encephalized. But if you take a look at some of the blue bars there for dolphins, you can see that their encephalization gets into the three, four, five range. That's significantly greater than all the great apes, significantly greater than everybody else on the planet, except humans. So something's going on there. They're, they're swimming around with these huge brains, especially for their body size. Just keeping track. Okay, so it wasn't just the brains that changed in size. They changed in morphology. And in many ways, this is even more interesting. Um, because if they just became bigger versions of their of the primitive brain, archaeocete brain, we probably wouldn't be talking about them here today, right? But they didn't. They changed in morphology and in ways that are just 
fascinating because they changed in terms of how they uh, integrate sensory information, the input output organization of their brain changed pretty much everything. Um, and this gives you an idea from some of our work uh, using um, uh, see, uh, computed tomography to reconstruct the brains from cranial cavities of fossil dolphins and whales. And you can see from 37 million years ago, that's not a CT reconstruction, that's just a drawing from an actual fossil. That was what the RQC brain looked like. Um, and I don't know if I could use the pointer or, but if you, if you take a look on that part of the brain, that brain had a big, thanks. Thank you, sir. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this brain, see these, this part, that's the olfactory bulbs. Whoa. This is the cerebrum. This is the whole cerebrum, cerebellum. And then as they, as you get more modern, now here's 14 million years ago, your rhinodelphus, take a look at that. Now the olfactory bulbs are kind of there, but they're in regression. And look at that cerebrum and how it has become more voluminous, okay? Now, um, I'm sorry, at 27 million years ago, xenorophus. And then at 14 million years ago, we lose the olfactory bulbs completely. And we have a, uh, a huge cerebrum, and um, it, it looks a lot like modern dolphin brains, and that's the brain of a modern bottlenose dolphin. So the brain got bigger, but the parts of the brain that got bigger with the parts that have to do with intelligence. And they also lost the capacity for smell. Talking about smell being so important for elephants and so forth. Uh, smell is not very important <laughs> for dolphins. So today, um, I'm gonna be mostly discussing bottlenose dolphins because we've done the most work on that. But we, I will include findings on orcas and, and other delphinids as well. So I wanna talk about some of the characteristics of the modern cetacean brain. And I'll talk about three realms of, of information. One is sensory input and integration. Second is paralimbic elaboration. And the third is neocorticalization. So let's take a look at sensory input and integration. On the left, you see a bottlenose dolphin brain. And on the right is a modern human brain. And I've labeled the primary sensory input regions for the, on the cortex uh, for both species. And as, as you probably know, in, in our own brains, um, auditory information comes in and goes to our temporal lobes Visual information comes in and goes through the back of our brain, our occipital lobes, and we've got one sensory uh, cortex for audition, one for vision. Um, those maps are shown on the left for the bottlenose dolphin. The visual primary cortex is at the apex and down a little bit of the inner hemisphere cleft and the auditory primary cortex is right next to it. So they have a property called cortical adjacency. And we think that that is the kind of brain that would produce echolocation, obviously. We know that dolphins are very sophisticated in terms of their ability to mentally represent objects cross-modally, across audition and vision. And so along with that came a complete rearrangement of all the input output for dolphin and brain, uh, dolphin and whale brains. But hold on to your seats. Looky what we found. So in a recent study I did with Greg Burns, um, we found that 
actually dolphins have two auditory primary, primary auditory cortices. Not that they have a primary auditory cortex and then it, that information goes somewhere else and gets integrated. Yeah, every brain does that. No, there's two input regions and we use diffusion tensor imaging uh, to, to do that. And that is a kind of MRI that allows you to trace the trajectory of information flow in the brain. On the left, you see um, the human face and the arrow points to A1 uh, primary auditory cortex. And we've known for a while on the right about the blue arrow for the dolphin. That's what I just showed you previously with the auditory cortex on top. Well, we, we put a seed in there. We, we did a number of studies um, with several dolphin brains. They have an ascending track that separately goes to the temporal region of their brain. So the question becomes, okay, is that homologous with our A1? What are they doing? How are they, I mean, they've got two auditory regions. Now, you could say that A1 does a lot of the auditory processing for uh, communicative sounds and, and things that all mammals do. Maybe A2 is the echolocation specialization area. But it's shocking to think that the, the level of complexity here, how, do, how does A2 and A1 get um, integrated? We don't know. We're continuing to work on that. So let's talk a little bit about the paralimbic lobe. Yeah, I talked about the paralimbic lobe in the movie Blackfish because I was so struck by how highly elaborated it appeared to be in the orca brain. And uh, I still am. And, and when I say paralimbic, I mean the tissue that is near the limbic system that connects um, the limbic region with some of the other uh, cortical areas. And one component of that is, is something called the cingulate and the paralimbic lobe. And very generally, very generally, they have to do with emotion, memory, learning, lots of other things. And if you look on the left, you can see that uh, basically this is a coronal image of a human brain from an MRI. And this cleft here is the cingulate sulcus. And the surface area of that sulcus gives you some idea of how much tissue is packed into that brain in that particular region. If it's not very wrinkled, then it has a certain surface. If it's really wrinkled, then that tells you something. It tells you that there was an elaboration of that part of the brain in evolutionary history. Okay, that's a general statement. Let's go to right, the orca brain. This is a coronal uh, of a postmortem orca uh, brain that we studied back in 2004. Top, bottom, left, right. And I'm showing you two areas. One is the cingulate cortex or sulcus in the orca brain, you can just see how highly elaborated that is in that region compared with that same region in humans. The other thing about it is this, the paralimbic lobe, okay, right here. Now, when I say paralimbic lobe, it's not like humans don't have paralimbic tissue, but Dolphins have taken it to another level because it's so elaborated, it has become its own lobe. And we know that it has very, very strong ties that go between the limbic system 
and the neocortex. So there's something about what this part of the brain is doing and what this part of the brain is doing in dolphins and whales that's just very, very important for them. Another fascinating area of the brain is the insula. The insula or insular cortex is involved in some modes of self-awareness and social emotions and even motor control. And on the left is the human brain again and outlined in green is the insula. This region right here is pretty elaborated in the human brain. But here's that same region in the orca brain. Okay, so again, we see an elaboration of surface area of tissue of, of modules in the in the coronal image of the orca brain. We don't have a quantification of that yet, but um, we're looking at this uh, gross morphology, and we're saying this is an interesting part of their brain. Now I want to turn to neocorticalization. This is, again, um, this is where all bets are off. Um, if you want to challenge anyone about who's, who's saying that, you know, the human brain is the most elaborated brain, the most complex brain, here you go, okay? So first on this side, we have the killer whale or orca brain at about 5,000 grams. Balno's dolphin brain at about 1,800 grams, and the human brain at about 1,350. So, you know, obviously, absolute size doesn't tell you all that much, and, you know, you're going to hear about really tiny brains that do lots of good stuff, too. Um, and these guys have big bodies. But keep in mind, also, that the encephalization quotients for these three species are way above average as well. So. These are bigger brains than you would expect, even for big bodies. So let's look at surface area and gyrification. Um, here's the deal. When you look at the neocortex of any animal, right, you can take that sheet and pull it out and stretch it out, and it's going to have a certain width. And within that sheet, you have certain modules that process information. Um, turns out that in the primate brain, you have six layers. Well, it turns out that in the dolphin brain and in other dolphin uh, whale brains, you have five layers. It's a thinner cortex. They don't have granular layer four, which happens to be the, the main input layer for our brains. So you got to say, what? Where's the information going? They don't have a granular layer four. I mean, how do you do life without a granular layer four? Well, you do it by inputting to um, layer one and then just going down there. But think about that. Their whole neocortex is organized very differently in terms of not only input output, but what happens to that information and how it gets integrated and processed while it's in the neocortex. It's a completely different thing. But because they have a thinner cortex, um, they also have more opportunity to fold their cortex. Um, and if you look at the surface area of dolphin brains, for instance, um, you see that the surface area of that cortex is uh, much greater than it is in the human brain. And you saw this in the, in the MRI slides that I showed you, okay? So it seems to be that surface area is where cetaceans add a lot of processing power, okay? by folding it up. There's nothing about this cortex that says it has to be folded like that or so extensively, but it is. And in fact, this is the most convoluted brain on Earth, and that includes humans. So if anybody says, oh, we got a lot of wrinkled, we got a wrinkled brain that makes us so intelligent, 
we are bested by the orca and many other dolphins. What's also interesting is that if you look at this in terms of scaling patterns, mammalian scaling patterns, you find that the orca brain and many dolphin brains have more folds than expected for mammalian scaling patterns. So as brains get big in mammals, they get more, the neocortex gets more folded. That's just the general uh, trend. But these guys are even more, have more surface area than you would even predict from that basic trend. Which has led a lot of scientists to really note the profound corticalization of the dolphin and whale brain. Here are two very recent findings, one by Wright et al. in 2016 where they looked at, this was only the second study ever done of the orca brain where they used MRI and did some quantification of, of different portions of the brain. They found that the cerebrum accounts for a higher percentage of total brain volume in orcas than in humans. Now think about that. We're not talking about big olfactory bulbs or big this, that. The part of the brain that we think is so involved in higher order cognition takes up a greater proportion of the brain in orcas than in humans. Another interesting finding from Mortensen is they looked at the neocortex of the long-finned pilot whale, another delphinid, and they used a technique to try to count the number of neurons and glial cells in, in the neocortex. And they estimated that this animal has substantially more neurons and glial cells than the neocortex of other large brain mammals, including humans. So the question then becomes, what are dolphins doing with their large complex brains? We get into dolphin psychology. Now, as you know, there's two lines of research that have informed our understanding of who dolphins are. One is from studies of captive dolphins, where those studies have imposed experimental conditions. Um, and I will talk about those. And then other studies that have been observational and have looked at the behavior of free-ranging dolphins. And we can talk about and have a discussion about the relationship between these two lines of evidence or these capacities and, and these observations and these behaviors, because obviously there has to be a relationship. We just don't know what that is yet, but we think that the, these studies can inform these. Now, I have to tell you that after I did a number of studies with dolphins in captivity, I gave that up because I realized what was happening to these animals in concrete tanks. So I'm not endorsing this research for the future. What I am saying is that that doesn't mean we throw everything out. There's been a lot of brilliant work done by people like Lou Herman, who's passed away, a um, number of people, um, who have shown incredible capacities on the part of the bottlenose dolphin, language comprehension. Um, if you don't like dolphins and tanks, that's not a reason not to use those data to help you understand your research subject, who they are as long as it's good work, right? I mean, the, the stuff I, I just showed you on the cortex, how do we know the visual and auditory primary region are in that part of the cortex in dolphins? Because Russia doesn't have an IACOC or any animal welfare issues, so they do whatever they want, right? Does that mean we decide that we're gonna blind ourselves to that information? No, because it helps us to understand who these animals are. It doesn't mean we have to do it or endorse it. So here's a general statement. 
The extraordinary cognitive abilities evinced by bottlenose dolphins, orcas, and other delphinids in captivity are reflections of their complex behavior in the natural setting, and in particular, their social complexity. So let's take a look at, at some of these. We're gonna look at self-awareness, social complexity, and culture. Um, Joshua talked a bit about, a lot about self-awareness, and he's absolutely right. Nobody has a clue what mere self-recognition means. Not a clue. And if anybody comes up to you and says, I know, they're wrong. Okay? Nobody knows. And we're talking about something that you know, people have studied for years and years and years, and we don't really understand what it is about some animals who recognize themselves in mirrors and others who do not. Exactly what is that? We don't know. All we know is that some do and some don't. We're going to look at a number of manifestations of self-awareness, and I tend to see it as a continuum where the dolphins are on a very high end of that continuum. Um, we're going to look at mirror self-recognition, imitation, awareness of body parts. Josh talked about this too. Sensitivity to attentional states and even metacognition. So let's look at mirror self-recognition. We all know at this point that there are only a few species on the planet who pass this mirror test. Bottomless dolphins are one of them. And Diana Reese and I showed that back in 2001. And on the left, you see uh, uh, that's Tab. No, nope, Presley. Sorry, Presley. And he has been sham marked under his flipper, his armpit. And he's using a mirror to check out whether or not we've actually put a mark there or it's just an invisible mark. And um, I mean, Josh did such a good job at explaining the, the paradigm. I hope I don't have to say more about it. We basically use the same thing that, that, that he used with the elephants um, uh, using sham marking. On the right is Tab, and Tab has got a, right, a mark right here. And he's looking in the mirror. And what Tab does is um, start to rotate his head to look in the mirror. And what we did, this took a year and a half, and we had a number of control situations with mirror, without mirror, sham, non-sham, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we wanted to be sure of what we were seeing. And what we found is that um, these animals, when marked on a part of their brain, that they, on a part of their body that they can't see without a mirror, use the mirror, go to a mirror, and position their body in front of the mirror to see the marked part. Now, we're not talking about just sitting, you know, we're talking about marking them in parts of their body where they have to twist and turn and do all kinds of convoluted behaviors to really see. It's what I would call something like the wet paint effect, right? You're walking down the hall, you got a brand new suit on or a brand new dress, and then all of a sudden you see a wet paint sign. Holy cow, you go into the restroom, right? And what do you do? So you, you, you look, um, and it's I use the mirror to check out whether you have any paint on your clothes, right? And that's a similar thing to what, the, to what these animals were doing. They don't have trunks or hands, but they most certainly can twist and turn their bodies. And we saw a one-to-one -one correspondence between where we marked them and where they went and, and what they did in front of the mirror for the very first time. And we saw this in both uh, dolphins independently. Uh, so bottlenose dolphins recognize themselves in mirrors. That was just replicated recently by uh, Diana Reese and a graduate student of hers, Morrison. We also know that they have awareness of their own body parts and actions. 
Um, here's a dolphin uh, from Lou Herman's lab who is imitating a, a, a trainer. Um, and the trainer sticks her leg and her feet up in the air and the dolphin, this is not trained, it's spontaneous. Dolphin uses her flukes as a substitute for feet because she doesn't have feet. And what this shows through a series of, of studies that have been done in Lou Herman's lab is awareness of one's body parts, spontaneous mimicry or imitation, and also an understanding of how one's body corresponds to the body of another, of a member of another species, which when you think about it is very sophisticated. Very few animals really imitate in that way. They may emulate and mimic in some other ways, but um, to actually mimic and then to plug in the part of your body that is as close as possible to that primate's body is pretty sophisticated. They also show the ability to monitor the attentional state of others. Um, they do understand pointing um, and joint attention. And this is a great study that was done uh, by David Smith Dave, and, and actually David Washburn, uh, 2002. Um, it's a study showing that dolphins are capable of something called metacognition, which they um, probed with something called the uncertainty response. Um, and, and I'm going to try to put it simply because it was a rather complicated study, but they, this is what they did. They presented humans and dolphins with uh, a task, a discrimination task. Like, you know, tell me whether um, this sound, boop, is different than this sound, boop. Okay? That's easy. That's an easy trial. But the trials were varied from easy to hard. So what about this sound? Boop, boop. I mean, it's a little bit closer, right? So it's a discrimination task. And trial by trial, you know, you have a varying degree of, of difficulty. And you just have to say whether the two displays are or the two sounds are different. You press that button for different or that button for the same. And that's, you know, a lot of animals can learn that. Here's the kicker. But you have a third button that allows you to opt out of the difficult trials, because if you get it wrong, you get a timeout. Um, but you can opt out of the difficult trials without that penalty by hitting a third uh, lever. So you can say, I'm not sure. I'm not taking the chance. What do you have to do to press that third button? You have got to understand what you know and what you don't know. You are monitoring your certainty about that answer. That is metacognition. If we couldn't do that, think about when you take an exam in school. Sorry to remind you. But, you know, I mean, you take an exam and what do you do? You go through the items and you find the ones you can immediately, you know, knock off. And then you manage your time depending upon what you think you can answer or not and what you think you might know. Imagine studying and not really knowing what you know and what you don't know. You study on the basis of what you think you are certain of and what you're not. That's what this test probes. They did this with dolphins, they did this with humans, and uh, these two graphs show um, the responses, and the important part here is the solid line of what happens when you, the response, when the high and the low frequencies come so close together that it's, it's difficult to tell them apart. Humans, 
hit that third uncertainty level more and more and more, and it maxes out right here. Dolphins hit that uncertainty level more and more and maxes out right here. So both humans and dolphins response patterns were identical. And the humans, when asked, said, well, this is what was going on in my head when I provided you with these results. And the question is, is that the same thing that was going on in the dolphin's head when they provided those same results? Monkeys can do this too. Social complexity. Well, the social, here's a, here's a comment from Janet Mann, who's been studying at Georgetown, she's been studying dolphin social complexity for decades now. She says, the social life history and cognitive features of bottlenose dolphins show remarkable convergence with primates and, and other large brain mammals, um, offering a powerful method for examining selection pressures that favored cognitive evolution, tool use, elaborate social network structure, extensive maternal care, behavioral plasticity, prolonged development, and distantly related taxa. Dolphins and whales um, show some extraordinary uh, capacities in social realm. And now we're getting into the observational work of what dolphins actually do in the wild free-ranging, and this is the work that's now really at the cutting edge of understanding who these animals are. Um, what you see there are what's known as male alliances. Um, they are manifest by synchronous swimming and diving. And we know that um, in dolphins, orcas, many other delphinids, there are individual roles that individuals play, and I'll explain that in a moment, that there are higher order alliances, which is quite rare in the animal kingdom, meaning alliances of alliances, hierarchical alliances, depending upon the circumstance, coalitions, cooperative hunting strategies, um, they have all of that. So we're talking about cooperation among elephants um, and cooperation and coalition forming, a role taking, that's the bread and butter of dolphin social life. This is a bottlenose dolphin social network from a group of dolphins studied over many years in New Zealand. It's by my colleague, David Lusso. And this is um, just a graph showing uh, the social network, in other words, each circle is an individual dolphin, and the lines between the circles represent who hangs out with who, relationships. And the bigger the circle, the more that individual dolphin is plugged in to the network, okay? Blue for boys, pink for, men, for girls, okay? But here's the interesting thing. When you look at this, okay, what this shows, don't ask me about the green dot, I forgot. I don't know what that is, green <laughs> dot. <laughs> when you look at this, okay, this tells you something. It tells you that when you see a group of dolphins swimming around, it is not just a bunch of dolphins. It is a society. It is a group of individuals who are organized according to different social roles and that the social roles differ across individuals. So that if, for instance, um, somebody over here, here, one of these tiny circles, if one of these individual dolphins dies or is captured or something, you can see that the social network pretty much remains intact. They're a peripheral individual. What about these or these? You take out one of these, the whole thing unravels because they have high connectedness um, with the whole social network. So these are kind of like the, move, the leaders of the group, the movers and shakers of these networks. And that's something very important to understand because it tells you that um, 
the individuality of each dolphin is critical to the survival of the entire group. And the social network analysis is an elegant way to show that. We know that they have very strong social bonds and that these societies are held together by strong emotional ties. We see a lot of evidence for this, observational evidence um, through the prolonged close parent-child relationship. Um, in orcas, uh, in some populations, um, male orcas stay with their moms their entire life. They're the ultimate mama boys. Mama's boys, if mom dies, he may die. He may go into a depression and die. And recently there was a death of one individual male. He's an adult. You know, we're not talking about a, a baby who's, you know, uh, nursing. We're talking about an adult male who lost his mom a few years ago. He, be, he was adopted by an aunt. But the for some reason, the aunt died, and he didn't have anybody else, and, and recently he died. Um, what's going on there with an animal who, as an adult, without social bonds, literally dies? Tells you about the nature of these animals. Um, there's all kinds of helping behaviors, Grieving behaviors, and we could talk about, you know, what's the psychology of that? You know, we still don't know what's in their head when they show these behaviors, but they do show behaviors that look like grieving. And mass strandings we're all familiar with. Why is it that these highly intelligent beings all mass strand at once when only one or two individuals in that group are actually sick or dis disoriented? Well, I think it has something to do with their sense of self in the group. And I'll mention that uh, shortly. Dolphins and whales are highly cultural beings. This is something that um, is a controversial statement for maybe even 10 years ago, right? Um, but we have discovered now through long-term field studies so again, the long-term field studies are really at the cutting edge of revealing who these animals are. Folks like Hal Whitehead, Luke Rendell, Janet Mann, Richard Connor, showing that many dolphin species have cultural traditions. And by that, I mean learned behaviors passed on intergenerationally and differing from one group to another. Um, and we see examples in dialects, tool use, hunting and prey choice, mate choice, all kinds of things. Here's two examples. On the left are a bunch of bottlenose dolphins off the coast of Georgia. Um, and I've actually seen this, um, where they are cooperating in a process of getting fish through strand feeding. So they all line up against the shore, and at some signal, they all rush the shore, and what happens is that the fish get a little scared. They jump up, uh, flip up on the beach, and then these guys strand themselves and catch the fish. And they always strand on the right side for some reason, and you see them there. This doesn't work as a hunting technique unless everybody does it together and creates this wave, right? Um, who gives the signal? Who decides this is what we're going to do in five minutes? Who decides? How do they communicate that? We also have an interesting cultural tradition in, uh, the, in uh, British Columbia, which um, I also had the opportunity to see last year, orcas um, at Rubbing Beach. There is an a, a island that has a lot of pebbles on the beach in uh, Johnstone Strait, and um, a number of orcas, now not all groups do this, just some groups go periodically, and they rub their skin on the, on the, on the pebbles. It's like a uh, spa, right? And they do this, and now it is known as orca rubbing beach. And not everybody does this. 
only some, and that's important because it's learned socially. It's not an inherent genetic kind of thing. Um, it is a culture, a cultural tradition for some orcas, but not all. Another example of the resident transient orcas in the Pacific Northwest. And this is a, a very interesting group. Um, in this map, you see the ranges of the transient and resident populations of orcas. The light yellow is the transient population and the dark orange is the resident population. It's interesting because the residents obviously have a much smaller range. They stay very close to in, inland. And in fact, next week I'm, I'm going to see them again. And there are times of the year when they share the area with transients. The transients come in. So what happens then? Do they fight? What? No. They partition resources. It turns out that the residents all eat salmon. 90% of their diet is salmon. Never mammals. The transients eat only mammals. So, so somehow, these two populations have worked out a way to live in the same area and partition resources where they don't compete. They have completely different dialects, behaviors, cultures, and they do not reproduce across at all. So, um, and who decides that? The matriarchs decide, um, you know, you, you cannot mate with um, somebody who's a transient if you're a resident. And because this has been going on for a long time, a lot of scientists are excited about this because of the fact that this may be speciation in progress. Eventually, at some point, we're gonna, we see cultural tradition actually producing genetic isolation. And this is something that they produced that um, was generated by the animals themselves. Now, uh, and I know I'm running out of time because I want to leave time for questions, but you got to see this. I have just a couple more slides. Um, there's the sponging culture, bottlenose dolphins in Shark Bay. This is the work of Janet Mann at Georgetown and, and her colleagues. Um, there is an area off of the coast of uh, Australia that has been studied for decades now, and they know that population of dolphins very well. Well, a few years ago, Janet Mann discovered um, an emerging culture in some of the bottlenose dolphins. She found that um, some of the dolphins were using sponges that they took from the bottom of the ocean and put wrapped around their rostrum and used that as they dug around in the sand for food so they didn't scratch up their rostrum. Now, she was able to document this because they, they're there every single year. She knows exactly the individual female who started this. She's still there. We also know that she passed that on to her daughter. So the start of that culture was from an adult, a single adult female to her daughter. That's a very interesting notion because you see a lot of that kind of parallel type of cultural transmission in other animals, where it starts with the females, passed on to the female offspring, and then it starts widening out, spreading a little bit. And here's a couple of examples of the kinds of sponges that they put on their rostrum. And now a subset of that population are spongers. Some are male. Many are female. It is passed down intergenerationally. We know that now because the study has been long enough. And there's social learning involved. And this image shows the, populate, the full population. And in yellow are the non-spongers. And in red are the spongers. And the spongers are a very exclusive club. Um, 
And we now know, we now know that spongers prefer to hang out and mate with other spongers. And non-spongers prefer to hang out and mate with non-spongers. Um, here we see again cultural traditions um, started by one individual now actually, and, and they've done some genetic work already, showing that these, the spongers and non-spongers are starting to diverge genetically. Which it, when you really think about what that is, it's absolutely fascinating. That story is ongoing. We have another culture that emerged in Australia um, for humpback dolphins. Um, this was this by Alan's very recent finding that um, for some reason the males in this population have started a gift giving culture. They go down and they find the most elaborate corals and things that they can pick up and you could see that, that thing that he's carrying around there, and they give it to the females um, so that the females will mate with them. Okay, so we're just starting to see this kind of thing, and you can imagine um, this kind of uh, culture and the course it's going to take over time as they study this population. So, to summarize, Again, who dolphins are. I'm going to look at the things we pretty much know from the data. And the next slide are things that we think, but are more speculative and intriguing that we could discuss. What we know about them is that they're highly intelligent. They're very self-aware, very high on that dimension. They're socially complex cultural beings. Does that, is that true for all dolphin species? Probably not. I mean, we don't know much about most dolphin species or most cetacean species. We're talking about maybe five to 10 species that we've actually studied enough to know this about them. They have an interesting combination of behavioral flexibility and cultural conservation. So they're very culturally bound. When a culture takes hold, they're very conservative. And if somebody wants to ask me about that later, I can talk about how there is a group, the population of orcas, who are so culturally conservative that they're starving to death. They are obviously exquisitely adapted to ocean life traveling long distances, diving deep, highly reliant upon learning during a very long, prolonged juvenile period. And they process information more rapidly and in a more integrated manner than we do. We know this from some of the brain studies, and certainly this is the case in auditory realm, where we know that they process auditory information at a much higher rate than we do. So now for some of the speculative stuff. From what we know about them, we could say, and we could discuss, that their social bonds are as strong or stronger than any in the animal kingdom, including humans. So when you think about things like mass strandings, you think about adult individuals perishing when they don't have social support. Um, you really have to think about whether there is a level of social bonding across, among certain dolphin and whale species that even we don't grasp. There is a uniquely strong connection between emotion and cognition. Well, obviously that's true in humans as well, but when you look at the connections, neurological connections between their limbic areas and the, the integrative neocortical areas, it suggests perhaps that they even have more integration or that their decision making and their processing of information may be even more integrated with their emotional 
system than we understand. That they may have a multi-layered sense of self, and this has been suggested uh, by uh, Harry Jarrison and a few others. Um, obviously, they have a sense of self as individual. They recognize themselves in mirrors and so forth. But there are some aspects of their behavior as social beings that have suggested to some scientists that maybe their sense of self also has a layer that is distributed across individuals. The way they are coordinated in their groups, the way they literally almost die without their group. What is it about the phenomenology of dolphins that could possibly be something that is totally out of the realm of what we might understand? You know, because we're groups, right? But we're talking about something that may actually be something that goes beyond what primates experience. And um, they also have a form of syntax in their whistle repertoires. And I'm just throwing this in there. It's a big one, right? But in fact, um, a number of scientists have published papers using information theory um, to look at the vocal repertoires of bottlenose dolphins. And to make a long story short, um, when they do this analysis with human uh, speech, um, they find a certain number that represents the level of complexity or structure in a, a repertoire of language. Well, they find the same number in bottlenose dolphins, okay? So again, if that number represents syntax, structure, organization in human vocal repertoire, does it represent the same thing in the whistle repertoires of dolphins? Fascinating question. And now I'm going to just ask you guys one question. Couldn't help myself because I've been so involved with advocacy for these animals for so long. Can beings like this thrive in concrete tanks? So I want to thank you. <laughs> um, about your last questions about the captivities in uh, orcas and dolphin, I saw you in uh, the documentary Blackfish, which uh, it, it's a story about a killer whale, Tilikum. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just wondering because you spoke about cultures um, in dolphins, do you think that it's easier for um, an orcas that has been kept in captivity for a very, very long time to? just go back in the wild? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. And it's an empirical question. The question I think if I hear it right is, is it easy for animals like this who have been say held captive for so long to just be reintroduced to the wild and have a life? Is that? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, the answer is no. Um, and the reason it's no is precisely because these animals are so social and complex and require uh, so much of a prolonged juvenile period to really know what it's like to be an orca, a pilot whale, a bottlenose dolphin. They don't have any of that when they grow up in the tanks. Um, they lose all that. They lose the ability. They, If they're born in the tanks, they never learn how to how to hunt. They don't know that a fish is, a live fish is food. They think it's a toy. Um, they don't have any of those skills. And moreover, unless they can be reintroduced to a natal social group, their chances of survival are extraordinarily slim. And how many individuals do we actually know where the natal social group is? Very few. For those who are captured as youngsters, two, three, four years old, they've been in captivity for decades now. Um, for those who are uh, 
born in captivity. They absolutely have no skills at all. Um, and the interesting part about that is that when you look at the welfare issues uh, for both captive born and born in the wild and then taken captive, they're exactly the same. So even captive born dolphins and whales do just as poorly as those who were taken from the wild. They, it just doesn't work. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thanks. Hi. I have two questions related to brain size. Uh, the sure. first one is, uh, how do you think it was important in the, in the evolutions of Sagesians uh, from land mammals to sea mammals uh, in the energy consumption of fishes and how it was related to the evolution of the big brains since they're so expensive in terms of energy? So if I understand you correctly, you, you are sort of talking about the notion that perhaps by eating fish, that exactly. contributed to large brains. Good question. Um, and I know there are anthropological hypotheses out there about that having to do with the human brain, right? Well, I would say that the evidence doesn't really provide, it's not strong for that in the dolphins and whales. And the reason is, is because they were in the water eating fish for a very long time before their brains ever got large. So it doesn't seem that there's any correlation between what they were eating and the brain enlargements. Um, they were fully aquatic 10 to 15 million years before that shift happened. So I'm not saying it doesn't have anything to do with what they eat, but it's, it's not as simple as, well, the fish so eating fish gives you a big brain. That, that's sort of not the case in dolphins and whales. OK, thanks. And my second question is uh, it's just I would like to have your take on the importance of the EQ measure. Because I, I know that in primates, there is so much variation between mm -hmm. brain size related to body mass and even species that have similar social organizations yeah. and, and nutrition. You can compare two fr frugivores yeah. and with the same social organization, they can have a dif different, completely different EQ. And it doesn't directly, I think, relate to intelligence. But you, you talked a lot about brain morphology. I think this has the most important. But so what's your take on EQ? My take is that it is a measure of something, but it is very limited. And I say that as somebody who did my dissertation work on this and kind of put it on the map for dolphins and whales. But I'm saying that it's not everything. It may not even be most of anything. It's just one measure. I think connectivity, morphology, those are the kinds of things that we can start to look at now that are much more important for how any organism processes information. Um, and we're also starting to see a lot of similarities across quote, big-brained and small-brained species. Um, small-brained species, and tonight I'll talk about chickens <laughs> doing stuff that we thought you had to have a giant brain to do. So you're absolutely right. I'm trying to sort of say, OK, here's the EQ, here's what we know, but let's look at the connectivity, the morphology, the behavior. That's much more important. Okay, and one more, maybe more personal question. Uh, you, you, with, with related to EQ, you, you, you showed a graph uh, where the chimpanzee had a lower EQ than mm -hmm. dolphins. Yes. Would you think, from what you know from your research, uh, would you think that dolphin might be dolphins might be more intelligent than apes? Well, maybe excluding humans, or I don't know. Just I don't think question. I don't think so, and I think it's because what we know now. I think has to be weighted more by what we observe in these animals than the just the EQ metric. Now, is a dolphin more encephalized than a chimpanzee? Yeah, it's a fact. It's a number. What that means, we're not sure. OK, thanks. I will restrain myself. I've got like 10 questions. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, there is one that, that kept in my mind from the moment you showed the uh, social network. Yes. Uh, we saw clusters of male and some cluster 
a female yeah. and I was asking myself, is there some family relationship? Is there some factor in, in those relationships? Because some nodes were very small outside. Maybe those are the babies. They have not time to, right. uh, to, to put bonds or, or learn social skills that make them important in the society. And the females at the very center, uh, like they were the mothers and matriarch, yes. you actually pointed a little bit on it, uh, talking about trends being set by the mother yeah. and then shown to the daughter. What is the relationship between family ties as, as we use them as humans? We are closely bond to uh, beings that are close to our genetic material mm -hmm. because we train them from an early age. Is that the same thing? Uh, um, is there some other relationship, adoptions? You talked about mm -hmm. an ant who's taken in a, mm -hmm. a baby. It worked fine, but when the ant died, it, it didn't, didn't That was actually anything. an ant who took in an adult male. Yeah. Because um, even as an adult, he needed social support. Um, so it's yeah. family, and yet how much farther from the mother can you go so those bonds would be very strong and very central. Yes. And this social network, is, is that simply a clan, like we understand it in human? Yes. A human clan is uh, loosely family-related with some adoptions. And yeah, what, what do you think about yeah. that? Yeah. And uh, the second question, I'll, I'll throw it <laughs> right away because it's a bit uh, linked to it. Uh, we have one difficulty from last week, linking measure to concepts. It's difficult to say, oh, this is a big brain, that means it's intelligent. Right. So what would be our, our, the cautionary word you would use since you have such a, a, a very compelling proof that uh, dolphins have just bigger brains than humans? Yeah. So what, what are the cautionary words uh, you would tell us to not step over this conceptual problem? Well, to answer the first question, you're absolutely right. I have a slide there from one study of social network analysis of this particular group of dolphins that one individual team has been studying for many years. I can show you other social networks from other populations. They do represent a great deal of complexity and a lot more than can be said or represented by what you saw there. There are clans um, and there are family, family ties are exceptionally important, particularly between mother and child, but it really does depend not just on species, but on population. So for example, in orcas, there are some groups of orcas who are matriarchal. There's a matriarch, she calls the shots. Um, when she dies, somebody else takes over or there's some disorganization until somebody takes over. Those are the, those are the populations where you have the, the males who live with their mother. They stay by their mother's side their entire life. They mate with who she wants them to mate with. They die if she dies, not always, but you, you get the idea. <laughs> um, so we have everything from that to orca populations that aren't as matriarchal. Um, there's a great variety, but in general, for dolphins and whales in particular, family groups, very important. Um, and a lot of the fem a lot of them are matriarchal or female centered with gangs of males roaming around, um, sort of going in and out. But um, the females are really, um, it, as they are in, I think in, in many species, the ones that hold everything together because the continuity of generations is mainly from mother to child. Um, I could, we could talk more about that. And then the other one is about the cautionary, I, I would caution that, again, I think we have to take all information in, right? So what do you do with the information about the fact that dolphins are swimming around with these giant brains that are energy expensive? You, they don't have to have those brains, but they have them. So our job is to understand why. I don't, you know, I mean, so it's, it's, 
uh, we should definitely not ignore brain size or encephalization level or any other measures of brain tissue, but putting it in perspective and saying that, you know, again, there's, we are so far from really understanding. I mean, we don't, no one will ever agree on what intelligence is anyway. And we're so far from understanding how brains relate to behavior and cognition <clears throat> that we just have to take all of the information and try to make something of it. But, you know, so, but you still go back to the fact that if they have that much brain tissue and it is so expensive, what are they doing with it? Hi. Hi. You mentioned that, um, like, the, in the dual occupation, the resident and the transient don't mate together, and mm -hmm. it was because of the the matriarchs that decide that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess it might be an empirical question. I wonder how do you know that the matriarch make the decision, and how how would she enforce this decision? How how does she push around like, other individuals <laughs> to do what they, uh, what she wants? Yeah, and so go also, to your room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, also how do you know it's not maybe a byproduct of uh, maybe individual being more suspicious of outsiders or out group members? I, I, I think both questions are related. This question of, well, maybe, you know, it's just stranger and, you know, they don't want to hang out with other orcas who have strange ways about them or are unfamiliar to them. And I think that depends upon many things. Sure, that is maybe in some proximate psychological way a part of that, right? So it's not like they are thinking, oh, we have to maintain genetic you know, separation, but there's something about being a resident orca that um, makes it either unattractive or not feasible for you to mate with a uh, transient orca and vice versa. Now, going back to your first question, how do we know all this? Because that, those populations off the Pacific Northwest and the Salish Sea are the most studied a uh, cetacean population ever. They've been studied by a number of uh, individuals, uh, especially Ken Balcom, who lives on San Juan Island, who's been studying them for 30, 40 years. Um, and there are detailed records of family relationships, genealogies, clans, pods, and uh, detailed observations of how um, individuals relate to each other. So the matriarch of the Southern residents, whose name was Grandma, passed away uh, last year, a couple of years ago. And so now what you wanna do is take data on what happens to that social network. Are we seeing any males or females going outside? Or is somebody else taking over that role? Um, we see this in, in many different ways, including, for instance, um, the fact that, you know, the matriarch, you know, things don't really start until the matriarch gets them started. So there's a greeting ceremony that a number of different pods of Southern residents have um, where they all come together. And they've determined that it really is the matriarch of each of those pods that give some kind of a signal to, to, to have that giant greeting ceremony. Um, you know, they know a lot about how they vocalize and so forth, as well as what they allow and don't allow. So it is very much the case that if you're a male and a Southern resident, um, you stick by mom in, you know, closeness in body. I mean, she's going to be right there, um, sort of pushing you in one way or another, literally. Um, so in many ways, that's what happens. And in other ways, it becomes just part of their culture, again, how they grow up. Um, and I mentioned something about the culture being exceedingly strong. For, you know, the southern residents off the Puget Sound area, are going extinct for a number of reasons. 
but one of the reasons is that they've dammed up all the salmon that they eat, and they only eat a certain kind of salmon. That's how sp specific it is. And they're starving to death. Now you would say, God, you know, switch to something else. Start eating mammals. They're not, they're not. There is something about their behavior, their psychology that is so culturally bound that that's just, it's not conceivable to them, if you will. So that's what we're talking about. Thank you. Uh, I was curious about what sort of policing of norms happens in groups and if it's sort of deliberative or spontaneous, but you sort of covered that with the last question. There is policing of yeah. norms um, with different kinds of communicative behaviors, yes. Uh, and is there so like punitive policing or is it just communicative? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, but I really wanted to, to know if uh, you could speak more about these alliances yeah. and the variability. So what sort of time scales, what sort of number of individuals are implicated and the frequency of contact and how that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, a lot of the alliances that we see, the so-called higher order alliances are generally male alliances that have been found in bottlenose dolphins. The males um, form alliances for, for many reasons. Obviously, cooperative hunting. There are a number of hunting strategies where you need coordinated group to, to be successful. But a lot of it is also to get females. And bottlenose dolphins are not the peaceful little angels of the sea that everyone thinks they are. They're, they can be pretty rough. Um, and a lot of the males will try to round up the females and they use their alliance with other males to do that. Um, so you might have um, a group of males who form an alliance of maybe three or four or five individuals that decide, hey, we're gonna go get that female. And they, they work together to round up that female. But then something else might happen, like a dolphin or another group of dolphins, males, come in from the outside that they don't know. And then what you see is instead of just the three to five individuals who have been working together to get females, um, they coalesce with other alliances to form a larger coalition to fight the the males that are coming in. And then that dis dissipates and they go back to being their individual alliances for females, but then when the time is needed, they come back um, and form these alliances of alliances when you need a bigger group to do a bigger job. But if you just, like, what's the biggest in terms of population? Like how many individuals would we see implicated in a- Oh gosh, I don't know. I, I, I'd want to say about 20, but I, I honestly don't know the exact number, but I do know that it is hierarchical. So um, obviously not everyone participates. It is actually a hierarchy of established um, alliances. It's not like males come in and then every male fights, you know, there are actually established, long-standing established coalitions that coalesce and break apart depending upon the need. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, communication, syntax, complex uh, yes. language. Has there been any trial in communication, you know, with using computer to reproduce what kind of what they're saying? Yeah, that's the six million dollar question, right? Everybody wants to talk to dolphins. Um, and we don't have a clue how to do that. I, and, and without being facetious, I mean, seriously, there's been decades of work done, playback experiments and so forth. We've established that they make different kinds of sounds under different contexts. We know that a few sounds represent certain things like you know, uh, a squawk or 
Um, when a mother disciplines her child, for instance, she'll do a buzz on him, things like that. But that's the quote easy because you see the correlation. You see the sound, you see the behavior. So, okay, one to one. It's all the other stuff that we don't get. Um, and we don't know really what their unit is, if they even have a unit. Um, so the, the work that I talked about by Brenna McCowan and Lawrence Doyle, Sean Hanser, it's very interesting because it's, it's extracted from whether you're looking at dolphins or elephants or primates or birds. It is a, new, it's a quantitative statistical analysis that you can apply to any repertoire where you have, you do have units. So if you can parse the whistles of bottle, a population of bottlenose dolphins, you can do that analysis. Parse the talk, the, the words of any in English or Italian or Spanish speaking, any human speaker, and you can find the structure it doesn't tell you what they're saying. It just tells you that there is some structure there. And we don't quite know exactly how this manifested in the free ranging population. I have to play the bad guy again. Unfortunately, we have to stop now. The good news is that there'll be a panel and you can ask Lori more questions and stay around because there's very important things this evening from Lori as well. Thanks.